Now for the reading this morning from Scripture, I'm going to read Isaiah 1.1, so you can get your Bibles open there, and then also open to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and just put uh, your bulletin or something there at 2 Chronicles 26. Now, usually I have you stand for the reading of God's Word, but I'm going to read a lot of Scripture this morning by way of introduction. So I'm going to have you remain in your seats until the last passage, then I'll ask you to stand with me. So Isaiah chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 1. I'll give you a minute to finish getting ready. And also have your Bibles marked to 2 Chronicles 26. Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. Isaiah opens his book and says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So four different kings. Now turn back with me to 2 Chronicles 26. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles 26, verse 3 and following. The first king. And I'll go ahead and put these up so you can follow along. There were many other kings, but we're talking about the four kings of Judah not the northern tribes or the northern kingdom, but rather just these four in the days of Isaiah's ministry, beginning with Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. By the way, his other name is Azariah, not to be confused with the priest who's also named Azariah. So depending on where you're reading, you're going to read about either Uzziah or Azariah, and then you'll be introduced to a priest named Azariah. Continuing on, skip down in that same chapter to verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood the king Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God." Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, besides the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out, because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. So Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now go down to chapter 27, the first two verses. Jotham, Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, and his, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord. Good idea. But the people acted corruptly. Go with me now to chapter 28. <clears throat> chapter 28, the first verse. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord, as his father David had done. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and he made molded images of the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnon, and he burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Go with me to chapter 29. Chapter 29, the first verse. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, and his, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Go to chapter 31. Still speaking about the same king, Hezekiah, chapter 31. And go down to verse 20. 2 Chronicles 31. <clears throat> Thus Hezekiah did... 
throughout all of Judah what he did, what was good and right and true before the Lord his God, and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart, so he prospered. And now go to chapter 32, <clears throat> chapter 32, and beginning in verse 24. Chapter 32, verse 24. And now please stand with me as we close out the reading of God's word this morning. King Hezekiah, verse 24. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord. And he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Jerusalem, Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, and he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, stalls for all kinds of livestock, and folds for herds. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of the upper Gilead and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about, about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness indeed are they written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, and the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers. They buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Denny, it's a busy, exciting week. Do you feel like you have a strong enough voice to lead us in prayer this morning? Would you please do that? Let's pray. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. So I've had a lot of people ask me if I am ready um, to start Isaiah, and I am. I am ready to go. I am well prepared, and yet I am still concerned. I have been anxious. I have been nervous. I have been fearful, and I think I've put it off to some degree getting started, but here we go. And the reason I'm concerned is because it is a big book. It's a, it's a big task, and um, some people have stated that it's the Romans of the Old Testament. And I, I wonder if... Um, I, I just, it, the Old Testament literature is going to be uh, difficult for me to work through. I'm much more familiar with the New Testament, so on a personal level. But as a church, it's also going to be somewhat concerning because it's going to take us about two years, I think, to get through the book of Isaiah. So I hope with that we're steadying ourselves for this journey. Um, I think it'll be a really good one for us. But the other thing, the other concern I have, and this is going to be something I'll bring up periodically, is the content of this book. We're going to be talking about the nation of Israel that did not seek the Lord. And I am reminded there's nothing new under the sun. And having said that, I think as you read and study it with me, you're going to feel at times like we're reading about ourselves and our own nation. And my concern is that we don't equate what we're reading with ourselves. The U.S. is not Israel. Israel is not the United States. And so we've got to be careful to not claim any promises that God made to his nation Israel, especially about prosperity and land. We've got to be really careful to do that. When we come across passages where God makes promises to his people, to those who are redeemed, we want to claim those and rejoice in those. But there's something else. Even though we're not Israel, Israel was not seeking the Lord, and God was preparing judgment all the while. And I can't help but wonder if God isn't preparing judgment for our nation. And that's a fearful thing to think about. Because I wonder how we would do if what took place in Israel happened to us. Captivity, separation being assimilated, all of those different things. And I just, I just feel the need to make sure that we're prepared for whatever takes place in our lives. At the same time, I'm reminded that God oftentimes accomplishes redemption through judgment. 
that God is a God who is pleased at times to take people through very difficult things in order to redeem them. And so in that we're going to rejoice. Today what I want to do is introduce the book geographically, historically, and contextually. So let's get to it. We've got a lot of maps that I want us to see, beginning with the land that will be in play in the book of Isaiah. Boy, that's not a very good map, is it? For those of you who are far away, this is the Middle East. And the land that we're going to be talking about stretches all the way from Turkey down to Pakistan, from Egypt up to Afghanistan, and all those lands between Iraq and Iran, Jordan, Syria, Damascus. All of those things are going to come in play. And of course, as well, will be the nation of Israel. Um, I, these are not very good, so you'll have to come up and look and squint at these later on. Um, you should know where Israel is on the map. It's along the Mediterranean uh, coastline. It goes about halfway up the coast of Turkey. It's not a very big nation at all, and it does stretch down into the Sinai Peninsula, down to Eilat, the, the sea, coastal sea down there along the Red Sea. Um, but there's lands that are also in dispute. You have the Gaza Strip off in the west, and in the east, as weird as it sounds, the West Bank is also under contestion right now. So the land is, is always in turmoil, not only within, but without. Um, back in those Solomon's day, <clears throat> after the reign of David, <clears throat> Israel was really, really big. It went all the way up to Turkey, and it went all the way down deeper into the Sinai Peninsula and past the Jordan into the east to where like the Moabites lived, lived back then. So it was actually a very large kingdom. <clears throat> but after Solomon, within two generations, the land was divided. It was divided amongst the northern tribes, which is known the northern kingdom, Israel is what it was called, and then the southern kingdom is Judah. And in that day, it really shrunk to about the same size it is today, but they didn't even control the, the, the coastline along the Mediterranean. What is known as the Gaza Strip was made up of the Philistines, and they went further north. And then off to the east was the Moabites, the Ammonites, and just all kinds of problems with enemies without, um, and their gods, and then problems within the nation as well. To put this in a timeline, what we're going to be looking at is this divided kingdom, and you can go all the way back to around 1000 BC and you'll see David and Solomon and their great prosperity. Then you're going to jump ahead. Within 100 years, the kingdom will be divided. And this would be the days of Elijah and Elisha. And remember how they did battle with the prophets of Baal and the Asheroths. So there was all these false gods in the land. Um, and in the meantime, out in the east, Assyria was rising. And it was going to become a really strong force and power in that particular territory. Then we jump ahead a little bit further to right before Isaiah's time, around 800 B.C. Uh, there was actually two pretty good kings. In the north was Jeroboam III, and he was over Israel, the ten tribes up there. And in the south was Uzziah, and both of them were good kings at first. There was a lot of prosperity, but there was warnings. There was constant warning, be prepared, watch out, trouble's coming because you're not seeking the Lord. And it began with uh, Amos, and then Hosea picked it up for the northern tribe. So it was first Amos, and then Hosea. Oh no, by the way, this was also the days of Jonah. You remember Jonah, that guy that was read about this morning, spent some time in the belly of a big fish, right? Um, he was sent to Nineveh. And for those of you who like geography, you've probably heard of Mosul. Oh, that's actually ancient Nineveh. Uh, to be proper, actually, Mosul is on the west side of the Tigris, and Nineveh is actually on the east side of it. But Mosul spills over that whole territory now. So when we talk about these things, to give you a point of reference, just think about cities that you've heard in the news. That was Nineveh. So Jonah was sent up there to warn the Assyrians, and they repented. And yet Israel was warned, and she didn't repent. And then we come down to 745, and this is a big turning point, and this is where Isaiah's ministry is really going to begin with this guy known as Tiglath-Pileser. See if you can use that in a sentence this coming week with somebody. Did you ever hear of Tiglath-Pileser? Um, in the Bible, he's also referred to as Pool. And he was the, a great king of Assyria who started to expand the Assyrian Empire. And while he was doing that, um, De Hosea was up at the north warning. Amos had already died. Hosea's up at the north warning the people. And Isaiah and Micah are warning the people of Judah about God's coming judgment. With that, now let's get into Isaiah's ministry in particular, and it's a ministry to the southern kingdom of, of Judah. Some of you already read about this this week in 2 Kings 15 through 20, 2 Chronicles 26 through 32. Uzziah, also known as Azariah, was faithful, but as we read, he entered in the temple, assumed a role that was not his, and God judged him for that. But overall, Uzziah was a good king, and there was prosperity in the land. 
than Jotham. He was faithful, but you notice how the Bible said, but the people were corrupt. Typically, as goes the leader, goes the people, but not always. So he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, but the people are not. Then Ahaz, he was not faithful at all. Involved in idolatry himself. Even killed his own children in the worship of false gods. It's just unbelievable, isn't it, to think about that, that the king of Judah would do such a thing? And during that time, Israel, the northern kingdom, conspired with Damascus a little bit further north, and they came against um, Judah during that time frame. And that's where, believe it or not, these kings of Assyria come into play. We'll see as we work through this book how they were, there was an appeal made to these other nations to come and help Judah during this time. And then finally we have Hezekiah, who was faithful. He was a reformer. His life was extended, but in the end, he also had some pride, and he showed those princes of Babylon all the prosperity, and he was told that all that prosperity will one day be taken away. And it would, his family would suffer because of his pride. So this is what we're going to be looking at through the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah. And if you have your study guide, the first study guide goes through these 39 chapters, and this is what we'll cover, these four kings and the lifetime of Isaiah. If you want to take it back to a map, this map might be a little bit clearer. We start in 745, and we go down to 701 B.C., tiglath Pileser who was in control of the Assyrian Empire. And if you look at it, it was rather small at first when he came to power. And by the way, this is the same territory that ISIS primarily controls right now. This is northern Syria and northern Iraq today, the, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. So just on a world stage right now, you can see the same kind of thing taking place, this empire that is emerging. But under Tiglath-Pileser, he expanded it. He took it all the way down really close to the Persian Gulf, down to about where Kuwait is today. He took it up into Turkey, and then he brought it down into Israel and caused all kinds of problems in the land of Israel. Hosea and Micah, these are the days of Elijah. These are the individuals who are warning the people to watch out. Oh, and during this time with the Assyrian kings, there was three deportations out of the land of Israel. 734, 724, and 716, People were taken out of Israel, they were taken north into what is modern day Syria and then pushed eastward into Iraq and even over to Afghanistan with these deportations. And in 721, the Assyrians sent in a whole bunch of people into Israel. Now the reason they did this was this was the way to divide the people so they couldn't conspire against the kings of the day. So by dividing them, removing them from their clans, uh, making them assimilate into culture and culture assimilating in, and believe it or not, the Jews went right along with it. They, they had absolutely no problem assimilating, marrying unbelievers, and assimilating and buying into the culture and worshiping the false gods. So all this took place until the end, chapters 36 through 39, we'll get down to Sennacherib, and he comes against Judah, and God had elevated him to the position to do that, to judge these people. And then God says to him, I'm going to take you out by your nose because you're an evil, wicked man. So God raises up someone, uses them, and then puts them down again. Now that's the first 39 chapters. Then we're going to jump ahead about 100 years. And we're going to move in now to the Babylonian Empire, which is basically the old Assyrian Empire, but it does get a little bit bigger. It actually goes all the way down the Persian Gulf, goes deeper into Turkey, and makes its way all the way down into Egypt. You remember the King Nebuchadnezzar? Babylon. Babylonian guy, remember that guy? Again, the same idea, deportations in 605, which included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all those individuals, the same idea. Assyria is now diminished, Babylon has risen. And this time period, which we'll cover in chapters 40 through 55, is all prophetic. So Isaiah is writing about future things, and the end of this period is a guy by the name of Cyrus, who will take over now the new land, which is known as Persia. And Persia gets really, really, really big. It takes care of all the way out east, up to India, Afghanistan and Pakistan, takes all of Turkey, except for a small divot up there that remain independent, gets into Saudi Arabia, Sinai Peninsula, a good portion of Egypt. All of this land is now under control of the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. And again, this is prophetic. This is talking about the time frame of about 539 when Cyrus was in power, Cyrus the Great. And it takes us down to 400 B.C., which is the silent years when there was no word from the Lord until the New Testament. Uh, individuals like Daniel, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, all during that time frame. 
Cyrus was different, though. Cyrus was not only the king, but he was a kind guy. And he let the people go back to their homeland. So just to put it in perspective, Nebuchadnezzar takes the people out. Remember Darius? He was between the two. He's the guy who threw Daniel in the lion's den. Then within seven years of that final captivity, the Babylonian captivity, Cyrus says you can return to your land. And you'll remember guys like Ezra and Nehemiah, they went back and they rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the walls. They reestablished worship. So all this is taking place in the future. And get this, Isaiah, some 200 years before Cyrus is born, identifies him by name. And that's why a lot of people think that there must have been more authors to Isaiah. I have another proposal. What if God told Isaiah the guy's name? <laughs> why not? I think the whole thing is written by Isaiah. It's prophetic in nature after chapter 39. He writes about his lifetime, about some 250 years down the road, including a guy named Cyrus. So that's the overview as far as it relates to geography and history. Now let me just give you two contextual thoughts that won't take us very long this morning to introduce this book. For those of you who are taking notes, here's the word you want to use. People are foolish. This is going to be a big theme we're going to see in this book. People are foolish. Notice I didn't say they're fools. Some people are fools, but the reason I use the word foolish is because, unfortunately, that includes us at times, doesn't it? We might not be fools, but sometimes we, act, act, we are very foolish in how we act. Let's go back to Isaiah and just look at a couple of the first verses in this book. And notice the indictment from the Lord concerning his people. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not consider. By the way, that, that animal reference, just think about the different pictures you've seen of a military individual coming home and how their dog attacks them. That's the imagery to be brought up here. An animal gets it. It knows its master. It rejoices. But we as people sometimes are foolish, and we forget our master and our God. Verse 4, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward people who fail to obey God's law. And for Isaiah, it's going to be very clear, sin is rebellion. And often it has that touch of pride and its foolishness, which believe it or not, Isaiah, and I don't know if it's the right word, but I, I think it's the best word, Isaiah in his writing will actually with sarcasm mock their foolishness. There will be a, a disdain for it. Language that you would think, that's not appropriate language, and yet that will be the language that is used to talk about the foolish people who waste the prosperity that God has given them. Who don't use it for kingdom purposes to serve the Lord, but rather use it for themselves to selfish ends. And I have to tell you, already, as, we're, as I'm looking at this, if you're looking at this, that's going to be a really difficult thing for us to hear. Because we are a prosperous people. And we are a people, unfortunately, too often turn backwards from following the Lord. And it can happen just like that. I don't know if it's one breath or two breaths, but we're one or two breaths away from doing something really foolish at any given moment. And even if nobody knows it, it's still within our heart, isn't it? Because we'll have that thought, we'll, we'll have that vision of something that just isn't appropriate. And if we don't reject it there, what is conceived in the heart will work its way out either with our words or with our actions. And then add to that, in our busy society when we're tired, that becomes all the more evident, doesn't it? I was watching someone the other day and I thought, boy, I see some of myself in that because I do the same thing. When I get tired, I get grumpy. And when I get grumpy, I get sinful. And I thought to myself, ooh, not a good thing. <laughs> it's all right there. And we can be so foolish so quickly. And so this book is going to weigh upon us that we cannot do that. We must not do that. By the way, if you are a fool, that means you're still dead in your sins and trespasses. 
The message will be straightforward and clear to you. Repent of sin and trust in the great God Jehovah, Yahweh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not bowed before this great king, do it now before you meet him in eternity. When every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Do it now if you do not know him. I, I implore you today, be saved from your sin. Do not harden your heart. So the first message is people are foolish. The second one is this, the good news, God reigns. Amen? God reigns. He remains on the throne and he saves sinners. Amen? He saves foolish individuals. Amen? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. I'd like to read this entire chapter. It's short, six verses. Isaiah chapter 12. Fortunately, throughout the book, we'll see these glimpses of God's glory and His grace, and we'll want to be refreshed and rejoice in these things. Isaiah chapter 12. In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Just listen to the vibrant language here. Isn't that sweet? And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Amen? Isn't it going to be good on occasion just to be stopped and be refreshed that God is good? That He is our comfort, that He is our salvation, that we can draw from these wells of living water and be refreshed. It's going to be sweet. 300 times, more than 300 times, the name Yahweh is used in this book. Yahweh, the sovereign God, the God of covenant, will be reminded over and over again that's who He is. Also, 25 times as it's mentioned here, the Holy One of Israel. Who is this Holy One? Who is this Jehovah? He is the God who orchestrates kings and kingdoms. He raises them up and He puts them down again. When His people are sinning, all the while God can be staging an evil king to come in and bring judgment and discipline upon His own children in order that they might become more holy. In order that they might see their need and cry out to God for salvation. God is a good God who will use even an evil agent to accomplish His purposes. This is what we're going to see in this particular book. And God is the one who redeems and He always preserves a remnant. God will never be without a voice here on the earth. If need be, the rocks would cry out. But God will always have a people. And for Isaiah, this redemption that God provides always results in being a servant of Jehovah. If God saves you, it will not be about you, about your strength or your power or your might. But God will use the foolish things of this world, the weak things of this world, to exalt Himself. And if you are saved, you will be a servant of Jehovah so that the weakness of idolatry will be exposed and a true faith, a true trust in God will be demonstrated. Now that being said, don't think for just a moment that if you have enough faith, you can escape tribulation, persecution, and suffering. We'll see in this book, even the people of God, those who are redeemed, will suffer. The true meaning of history... It's not what we make of it, but it's about God who brings history to His end for His purposes. And even in Isaiah's life, we don't have it recorded in Scripture, he served under these four kings. But after the last king, Hezekiah died, Isaiah continued his ministry into the life of Manassas. And the Talmud, the Jewish history, tells us that Isaiah, for standing up for the Lord and the things that were right, was cut in two sawn in two. So don't think for a moment that you're going to escape. In this world you will have tribulations, you will have trials, but be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So have confidence. We need to be prepared, folks. And this is again, as I mentioned last week, I feel a burden over and over again to be personally, but us as a body, to be prepared to suffer in this world. But at the same time, preparing us for suffering that's coming I want to make sure we're prepared to be in the presence of God. So we are working to prepare right now for what's coming and what's coming ahead. Go, and by the way, you already know this is true. You know there's still going to be sickness, isn't there? You're going to get a flu. You're going to have a heart attack. Your cholesterol is going to go through the roof. 
All those things will take place. There's going to be drive-by shootings. There's going to be silly things like a Zika virus. What is up with that? Who likes mosquitoes anyway? This, and there's going to be terrorists. There'll be more weapons of mass destruction. There'll be odd things happening in the Middle East that impact us in our world across a great ocean. These things will take place, but God is still on the throne. Go with me to one last passage, Isaiah chapter 1. We'll close out with just this reading of Scripture. And I will tell you in advance what it is, rather than making comments afterwards. It is a reminder of two very important truths. Divine grace and human responsibility. We will affirm over and over again that God is a sovereign God in the book of Isaiah and that His grace is sufficient, it is weighty, and it is more than enough. And that will be good for us to hear. But we will not be able to escape our human responsibility. There will be a call to us over and over again to seek the Lord, to not forget Him, to not neglect Him, to not assimilate into culture, to not to buy into the idolatry of this world. We will be responsible to the grace of God to appropriate it. So that being said, please stand with me. I want to read Isaiah chapter 1. And I'll begin in verse 16. And then next week we'll get into the study of chapter 1. And notice first the human responsibility and then the divine grace. Isaiah 1.16 Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are told in your word it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And Lord, we know that you are angry with sin. That you have a righteous indignation against anyone who would disobey your law disregard your character and your person and your holiness. And Lord, I pray that the warnings that we'll read here will cause us to have the right disposition, not of fear in the sense that we tremble and we're afraid, but rather fear of worship for you and reverence for you. Lord, we need you to be our salvation. We need you to be our comfort. And we need you by your Holy Spirit to take such deep residency within us that as soon as something is, is wrong in our hearts that you convict us and cause sin to be stayed at that level. Lord, if, if you are pleased to bring judgment upon our nation, then may we be a people prepared to suffer well for the cause of Christ. Lord, if for a while you choose not to bring that judgment upon our nation, then please don't let us use our prosperity to feed our selfish lust and desires, but rather to look for that which is more excellent, to be your servants, to be involved in kingdom ministry, and telling others the most important thing is your son Jesus Christ and finding and knowing him and knowing salvation in him. Please work, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.